You're listening to the internet's wettest podcast about video games, consoles, and pancakes. The SML Podcast. What's up, everybody? This is the SML Podcast. I am your host, Joe. Joining as usual, Cole, how are you doing? I'm not dead. Yeah. Barely. I am flared up pretty bad, and I feel like shit, but I'm not dead. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I'm just just happy for everything today. That's that's a new take on you, yeah. (laughs) Honestly, I I started some new meds recently, and I've been feeling better. So maybe <gasps> maybe we found a good mix. Good. That's like, what I'm talking about. And it's That's- not just the pot talking. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, be honest, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little pot. Yeah. But it does help. It's always a little bit of pot talking now. <laughs> just it still says that. um podcast starting soon on the Yeah, it didn't change yeah, you don't thing. ever change that shit. Oh, okay. You don't care. <laughs> I'm I'm lazy. There's a kittens. Uh my video's not working. And this is all in the show now. Blah blah blah. Uh, Chris and Purnell are here. How are you two doing? Trying to just trying to hang low and cut loose, baby. <laughs> sure, you know <laughs> we swing low on the sweet chariot. <laughs> I I had a uh, a fun video game acquisition this week. Uh, oh yeah. Oh. If you are watching the Twitch stream, you might have noticed it already. Uh, we were at GameStop, and the the topic of collector's editions came up. And I mentioned the Destroy All Humans one, how we were eyeing that up for like 200 bucks the one time. And the girl was like, we have one of those fucking things. (laughs) Like, what? She was like, we have one of those things. It's been sitting here since it launched. The one employee pre-orders some big collector's editions and they just sit there because he never buys them. And do you (laughs) want it? How much is it? Hundred bucks. This is normally, I think, four hundred dollars. Wow. So what do you mean like as far as like was it did it retail for four hundred? You yeah. saying it's like at a rarity level of four hundred dollars? It's a it, it was a retail for three or four hundred dollars original retail, and it was dropped down to a hundred bucks at GameStop. Damn. So now I wow. have a two foot tall alien statue hanging out in my office. That's, that's, that, that's that GameStop report right there, boy. Uh, damn right. It's it's good to know the people who work at GameStop. I um, it's like when I bought a PSP, a uh, brand new one in 2014, because they just had one in the back, and I <laughs> happened to mention it. Nice that I was like trying to get one. I'm sure you pissed off some staffer big time. That was my <laughs> PSP. <laughs> no, it was it was in the back. He didn't have to go and find it for me. I didn't ask for. I didn't. I was asking about used ones. Mm. And he was like, oh, yeah. "Hang on a minute. I think we got one in the back." I'm wagering that. I'm, I'm saying I'm, I'm assuming that the employee that you pissed off was not the one that said, "Wait and send the back." I'm talking <laughs> oh, about <maybe>. the guy <laughs> who, who did it, had a, did a good job hiding it, but never quite earned enough money to get it without having to cut into his bills. And then old Chris comes along, is like, "Oh <laughs> snap! Check it out, a pisp!" And he's like, well, my one hundred dollars." <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Like sucker, it's my nail, motherfucker. I was like, well, shouldn't have waited what five years to get a hundred <laughs> bucks. Yeah, well, you know, oh, it was going to. It was, it. Well, or maybe, maybe it was his anniversary present. You know, <laughs> you know, you know. What they say, the fifth year anniversary is the PSP year. I think oh, so. Yeah. yeah. Well, that and makes the, sense. The new model of wedding press <laughs> anniversary presents. Well, fifty years be better, is what a golden switch. <laughs> <laughs> golden switch. What about the oh, golden we're all, Wii? We're all, we're all taking golden switches. <laughs> the Queen's golden Wii. Yeah. <laughs> Which, we talk by the way, didn't, they, didn't they sell that or something recently? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's on. It's for sale right now. I think still right. I thought it sold at auction. Oh, Maybe they it relisted is. it. Who knows? Somebody well, made that entire thing just so that they could say the Queen's golden Wii. <laughs> <laughs> oh Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Christ! Thanks for nothing. I forgot about that. Put me right back in that youthful gutter where I belong. <laughs> the youthful gutter. I wonder if it at yeah. least came with a game. 
We all would got you, gold Would you be beans. pissed off if you got golden a golden beans. Wii, but it didn't come with any games? Oh, I, mean, it, uh, I, re- I remember it did come with a game. It came with uh, one of the bullshit Ubisoft like family sports games. Oh, what the fuck? Because it was from Ubisoft. Ubisoft, Man. whatever. Maybe it came with a copy of, you know, Wario Land Shake It, you know, to collect that gold. <laughs> Wario that would have be been a good though. idea, but no. Friggin' Ubi. Ubisoft. Yeah. Great Ubin. But like, I would just... Rayman. So how is everyone Nasser. else's week? <laughs> well, clearly not involving enough on the Rayman in my week, apparently, but um, <laughs> my week's been okay, to be perfectly honest with you. I'm just, you know, trying to make sense of every fucking thing and need more fucking money. I need to stop swearing so much, but fuck, can't. I'm already hooked on the stuff. Yeah, you don't need to stop swearing. The swearing's the good shit. Mm -hmm. That is. Ooh, touche. In that case, I'm good company. even chiming in on that. It's like, fuck, I will. Fucking cursing (laughs) up more. (laughs) Fucking ain't right. They say the people who who curse more are more intelligent. Wait, really? Yeah. No, and I I think that's bullshit. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, he nailed it. I, I think I, I'm with Joe on that, maybe. But I don't know. At the end of the day, though, I feel like like I'm just trying to make do with my time. And also just this whole like getting back to, you know, I don't want to say normal bit, but just like adapting to like not having to do the masking stuff anymore, yet still doing the masking stuff. But it's like it's weird. Like I don't have to anymore, but now I want to. Like it's. Mm hmm. Yeah, same. It's the wrong, the wrong person will say your condition, but then you're like, you know, I haven't been sick in some time now. Like I, I like not being sick. Also, I like being able to make stupid faces and having no one be able to tell I'm making said faces. Yeah. It's just perfect to me. Why would you give that up? <laughs> Very true. But then, you have, but then you have the choice to take it off should you want to. So it's like you know, it's the best of both worlds. But of course, I'm sure I'm not going to any banks anytime soon like that because I'm like, finally, <laughs> you can bop this guy again. Fuck him. <laughs> what are you doing in here with that mask? Well, take it all. But <laughs> I don't want you to know I'm how depressed I'm about how much money I got in my account. Well, <laughs> guess what, chump? Deal <laughs> with it. We're all depressed about how much money we have in our accounts. Oh, mm. yeah. I mean, I got paid today. I'm fine. Because, <laughs> like, I've been I'm doing I'm in the middle. It's such a weird situation. Like, right now, I'm also, like, stuck in this concept where, like, uh, like I've been reading documents on, like, how to date while broke. <laughs> like apparently that is a whole thing I said I shouldn't even say apparently because if anything it just makes sense that it exists it just I never thought of it because like I'm trying to like save money to pay my bills and all that and it's like but I also need to be taking people out and they get mad at you if you don't pay for their stupid expensive dinners you're like you know I gotta pay a mortgage on a freaking chump change salary here <laughs> I'm not rich baby you know <laughs> you want somebody that's responsible but at the same time i gotta be able to pay for your dinner at this freaking steakhouse too what do you want from me how about we just go out and get ourselves some 7-eleven slurpees and um <laughs> maybe i'll get maybe maybe if i had a big i can take get you one of those like big bites or the super big bite you know the one you know the, the, the real value ones. outback let me tell you about this place called bonanza <laughs> girl you would love it steakhouse love buffet bonanza. <laughs> Believe it or not, we still have two bonanzas in our area. Is really? that um is that your regional version of Golden Corral? I think they used to be national, but they just mostly died out. But you know what I'm talking about, yeah. Golden Corral, right? Okay. I didn't know if that was We unfortunately don't have a Golden Corral in our area. I They they closed everywhere because of the pandemic. They're gone yeah. for good. Oh really? Oh the entire yeah. chain? Oh shit. Yeah. Oh, we sucks. had we had went to one about two weeks, yeah, about two weeks before everything shut down, without realizing because it was kind of like our anniversary tradition to go because that's where we went all the time when we were young and that was all we could afford, right? Yeah. So we went for our anniversary and it will never get to go again. Damn, it's gone. That sucks. Well, if you want to talk about memories that you can never experience again related to relationships, Ashley and I met on MySpace. <laughs> Ooh. It's how's David how's and that I for something that doesn't ICQ. exist anymore? <laughs> I think well, I mean, ICQ well, still actually exists. That's what ICQ. David and I met on. Sorry. How do you meet on ICQ? Well, I thought ICQ was just straight up a chat program, which means you have to already know who you're dealing with before they can reach out to you in the first you place. You could actually search for like 
people in certain areas and stuff. And David was working in um, my hometown and he was looking for people to be friends with after work. And he wasn't even looking for a girlfriend. <laughs> he thought I was a guy because my name is Cole. Like, and hey, he was just saying? like, I'm you just looking know. for people to be friends with because I'm in town all the time and I don't have anybody to hang out with. You want to get drunk? Somebody for Mario Party. <laughs> <laughs> he was looking for you know people to play pool and and bowling and shit and just it just so happens I'm I like looking for things. someone to go bowling with. <laughs> <laughs> and it it just I so happens hit up David. <laughs> he doesn't do that shit anymore. He's too Aww. broken and old now. But uh, the bowl. Eh. <laughs> Swinging a sixteen pound well, ball ain't easy, man. Not, there's not bowling around here anymore. They close that. Well, our the one closest to us burned down. Oh God! It was it was an insurance claim. <laughs> and, oh, yeah, uh, it was a plan burning. And uh, theoretically, yeah, allegedly. <laughs> Allegedly, and uh, oh, so that was that was the thing that happened. But uh, so yeah, ain't nobody going bowling there anymore. But yeah, he was just he was searching for people in my hometown to hang out with, and he found me, and we were chatting. And then I was like, oh, by the way, uh, you know, I'm a girl. <laughs> <laughs> like lucky. <laughs> but well, unfortunately for him, I wasn't 18 yet. And so he he absolutely refused to talk to me anymore. Smart. And yeah. Very and smart. Then, and then three weeks after my birthday, after I turned eighteen, we met up and there we went. Nice. Like, hey, hey, hey girl, you eighteen yet? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, he wouldn't Why? say a thing to me. I was the one that messaged him back. I was like, oh, that's pretty Hot. cool. Yeah. I went back who's eighteen. <laughs> And, I'm uh, right up. <laughs> yeah, I was like, we should catch some pool. <laughs> and there we went. Been together like, for 20 years. That's freaking awesome. That means if you met him at 18 and stayed with him, that means you had to do any of the dating shit. You were just like, you know, this dude's solid. All right, I see no reason to change it up. Like, I'm, I'm done. I'm yeah. locking this I was this like, I found a good one. <laughs> I guess I'll keep it. <laughs> You're good enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's where it's at. That's what yeah. you want. I think I think was, that's what Ashley said with me. It's like, you know what? I'll <laughs> settle for you. I don't have the time to go looking around. You're good enough. I'll take it. Just watch the cats with me. Your nickname is now Goonie because, baby, you're good enough. <laughs> I know, on mine and David's second date, we had we had gone to the lake for a picnic, and we were just we were just sitting there shooting shit and stuff. And he gets really quiet and is kind of like staring off for a little bit. I'm like, are you okay? And he's like, fuck. Uh, he goes, I never fall in love with you. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't plan for this. I just wanted to for Mario Party. It happened this is not what he was looking for. <laughs> and yet, I didn't you know, want love. I wanted a player too. Same wanted, difference. He wanted True. somebody to, to play pool with. And then, you know, if I weren't a broken mess anymore, we'd still be playing pool. But yeah. He was looking for pool. He found family. Yeah, it's like I'm pretty sure it's a Hallmark movie. It became a family <laughs> hustle. <laughs> <sighs> oh, the man. wholesomest episode of SML ever. <laughs> it's the most romantic episode of SML ever. What are you talking about? And I have to review Leisure Suit Larry. <laughs> <laughs> if you're looking for love, this ain't the game for you. If you're looking to soil your knickers. Well, there you go. Cool. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Speaking of, should we get to the reviews? We do have a bunch to get through tonight. Oh, sure. Ah. Yes, indeed. All right. Well, we're going to kick things off with Rust Console Edition, developed by Double Eleven and Face Punch Studios, published by Double Eleven, released May 21st on Xbox One and PS4 for $49.99. Welcome to Rust. The only aim in Rust is to survive, overcome struggles such as hunger, thirst, and cold, build a fire, build a shelter, kill animals, protect yourself from other players, uh, or in my case, beat someone with a rock and then get beaten with a rock. <laughs> That reminds me of that old, like, freaking, like, Batman animation. She's like, beat him with a rock! <laughs> <laughs> I'm proud of you for beating somebody with a rock, though. I did. I they were sleeping. Managed... I got an achievement. 
I didn't think they hit somebody sleeping. I did catch somebody sleeping, and I stole their wetsuit, though. And I was like, bitch, I'm gone! Wee! And then um, I ended up getting sniped while I was building a house, so it worked out. Uh, I I have never played a survival game that has the lifespan of Call of Duty <laughs> respawns. <laughs> like, yeah, in Call of Duty, you spawn. And then you either get a kill or you get killed within like three seconds and do it all over again. And that's the entire match. That's what it felt like playing Rust. And that was incredibly frustrating because I love these kind of survival games. But I played Ark privately with just Studa on our own little save file. Sirs. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Privately on our own little save file where we could do whatever the fuck we wanted. And we didn't have to deal with with other people griefing us all the time. Um, But Rust has no private server. You cannot have your own little save file. And it is a curse. You you get no opportunity to explore the map. You get no opportunity to learn your surroundings. There's the most basic minor-ass tutorial that I have ever seen in my life. It's there. But it don't do much. Um, and that's kind of compounded by the fact that it, it doesn't it doesn't help you enough because it also doesn't help you identify the materials that you can you can collect. Because I, I hit so many different rocks and trees trying to figure out what I could and couldn't harvest. I feel bad for comparing this game to Ark and Conan, but those are like my benchmarks with survival games. And my theory is if you put a rock that is large enough to hit, I can hit it and get more rocks. But that's not the way rust works. There are certain rock deposits and you cannot tell them apart from other rocks at all. You just have to kind of dumb luck hit one and get a rock. And because the server's are so full of fucking people, you're not finding a rock to save yourself. You will be lucky if there is a standing tree. Because the servers are wiped monthly, right? Okay. And when the the first people on that server are 100% gonna be the ones who just bare bones out fucking everything and hoard it for themselves. So this, as soon as you spawn in, If you are not one of those first people, and even if you are one of those first people, but you don't have a big enough group to help you fight off the other first people, you're just going to be left scrounging for scraps, and they're not there. (laughs) Um, it It is really hard to get your footing in Rust. And it's even harder because... You may finally get somewhere, and in a month they're going to wipe the server in your box anyway. It didn't matter. You got to start all over again. There's two two sides to that, right? Like, it keeps one group from dominating an entire server and making an official server their private server in a way. Yeah. By keeping anybody else from being there. But on the other hand, it keeps anybody from really getting a good start, too. Unless they're in that initial search. Um, that's just, again, another element where letting people start out with their own private localized save game would be a blessing. Um, try not to compare it to ARC anymore after that. But <laughs> I, want, I, I would like to see more... It's a survival game, and I know that supplies are supposed to be scarce and stuff. But even just, like, the basics of wood and stone should be available. I would also... I I don't know if I want to say, like, oh, you shouldn't be able to be killed immediately. Because you can have some really cool fights if you run into somebody else who's just spawned. But I wish there was something that fostered um, camaraderie just a little more. I tried on several different servers... Every one of them had a swarm of super big ass bases <laughs> right around the major spawn points. And even if you did manage to like sneak past all that shit to try to go get you some stones and rocks to do the bare minimum, um, you were still going to run into other people who were trying to survive as well. 
and there was there was nothing to encourage camaraderie with with a random that you run into. There's an achievement for helping ten down players, and people did not care. They would just straight up murder me the moment they saw me. <laughs> there I'm were down, times. I'm down. Fuck you. <laughs> Even if I wasn't down, I would be standing there stark ass naked in my underwear with a rock in my hand going, what do I do with this? And then immediately I took an arrow to the dome and I just kind of sat there like, I don't even know what hit me. I spawned one time and was immediately killed by a horse that somebody else was trying to kill. The horse <laughs> one hit me before I even stood all the way up. Wow. And I just sat there like, ha, there are achievements for this game and there are guides out there and stuff for like these big, huge ass monuments that you're supposed to find and do these really cool puzzles and get this, these, these key cards and shit. Who can do it? <laughs> you can't live long enough to get anything done. I, I feel so bad like to be able to, to have to sit here and do this, do this review and be like, look, I've put weeks, weeks into Rust. And the most I ever managed to do was make a spear and build a wood house that somebody blew up with an explosive. Damn. <sighs> like every time I would attempt something, I was constantly shit on and knocked back down. I tried playing with friends. I had, a, uh, had an extra code I gave to Suda. I had him playing with me. Same thing, even with a little bit of help having somebody with my back, I still just could not get any progress. Um, this was made worse by the micro freezes and the lag. Like I said, I tried a few different servers, so I, didn't I am run into any of that. Did you not? No. Listen, I'm on gigabit internet <laughs> internet and a series X. And every time somebody would get within a hundred feet of me. I would have a micro freeze. Maybe I just didn't notice it. I don't know. Everything would go to a standstill. And then either I would be dead or I'd have an arrow in me <laughs> or I'd get sniped from across the damn hill. I, I just could not get going. And it bothered me because I, I wanted to enjoy it. I thought it was super cool the concept of like everything's a uh you know a wasteland and there's there's helicopters flying around and it's apocalyptic and like the basis for it to be a super cool survival is there and i get why people love it but i would have liked it a hundred percent more if i could have just played it by yourself on a on a small even not even by myself like if i could just have some invite people on to a, a private save that wasn't a public server where people were just going to stand and grief me. Yeah, well, it like, sits at 50 bucks, so what do you think of it? I'm going to go with a try it. It's a hard sell unless you are really intent on getting a group of buddies and running control of a server. But the idea is there. Yeah. It, the game isn't bad. It's just there's issues that need to be addressed. And one of that, one of those is definitely being able to play by yourself or in a smaller yeah. group. Because I didn't, I know I didn't put as much time into the game as you, but I didn't have many long lives. Yeah. Like, I, I would sneak around at night and break some rocks apart and then someone shoots me or, Someone comes up and beats me with a rock. I've had some good rock fights. It's so unbelievably dark at night, too. It Holy is. shit, you can't see a thing. And even I lit a barrel at one point, and it was still like there's no illuminating light from that whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And unless you light a torch, you can't see shit. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm sure there's lights and stuff that you can get eventually because you could with Ark and Conan and all that, too. But at, at the current state of survival, I was <laughs> flying at. Just I wasn't getting a light. <laughs> I was not getting a light bulb. <laughs> uh, 
All right. Well, next game to talk about is Leisure Suit Larry Wet Dreams Dry Twice, developed by Crazy Bunch, published by Assemble Entertainment, released May 19th on Xbox One, Switch, and PS4 for $44.99. Hey, ladies, it's time to get wet again. I am not done yet and still dreaming of you and Leisure Suit Larry Wet Dreams Dry Twice. I left new lost wages stranded in Cancun and had prepared to marry my only true love, Faith. Uh, Chris, where does the the game uh, pick up? Well, um, of course, I didn't play the prior game, so uh, I had to rely on basically a um, like basically like a one conversation sort of summary of the events of the first game. Basically, okay, so Leisure Suit Larry as a character is, or like as a game series. Um, started in 1987, and it was a point-and-click adventure title, um, which basically, you know, of course, leaned on it, the thing it's most famous for. It's really body humor and everything. B-A-U-D-Y, and I guess also B-O-D-Y. <laughs> um, but anyways, so, you know, and there were several um, Larry Laffer, you know, games, like basically point-and-click adventures that had to do with you know, that sort of humor. And then uh, he kind of disappeared for a while because the original creator of the um, show kind of left um, the company. But various companies, I guess, have kind of picked it up over the years. And, like, there was a couple of games in the mid-aughts which were like, this is his nephew or his cousin or, you know, something like that. And, like, you know, kind of trying to keep it up. Uh <laughs> in a manner of speaking. Uh, but um but yeah, like the wet dreams don't dry uh is you know the actual Larry and the way that they kind of brought him into the modern world is literally that he uh unclear, I think it must be covered in the first game, but he basically like was either frozen or something um, and woke up in the year 2020 or 2021, you know, the modern age. But he left, like, he's the exact Larry from 1987, a.k.a. the <laughs> first game. So it's, they use time travel, essentially. So it's, uh, not only is it point-and-click adventure games having to do with, you know, sex humor and things like that, but it's also a dude who was, like, already kind of an outdated swinger type, you know, guy who is, uh, you know, kind of, um, I don't know, a pathetic character, I guess. <laughs> I guess it's uh, the 1980s or the 2000s. He's still got to adhere to that penal code. Thing exactly. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, it's the same character, but now he's having to adjust to the modern age. Like he was already kind of outdated with his like seventies get up. And now, you know, he's having to, um, adjust. So where this game picks up is that he has his adventure. He falls in love with this lady called Faith who runs uh, kind of an Apple parody program or not program, like corporation. And um, but uh, due to his misadventures, like he blows up um, a villa on the island of Cancun, which, you know, <laughs> jokes like that uh, abound. And um, and we'll, we'll, of course, get to that in a minute. But, yeah, he blows it up, and she is assumed dead, but he's still not gotten over her. Um, and, yeah, due to circumstances, he has to marry the uh, the daughter of a, <laughs> a, a stereotype guy that is, like, I don't know. It's hard to be offended at this game that's already kind of out to get everybody, you know? Yeah. But, uh... He, he's a dude that wears a uh, sombrero on top of his sombrero. Oh, like his sombrero has a smaller sombrero on top of it. And so I'm, I'm kind of like, going right. to show some screenshots of this, but there's our, it is so phallic. Yes. Um, that is one thing I wanted to get to, but I'll get to it right now is that I believe that whoever did the art design for this game, like either had a challenge uh, from the developer or just among just in and of themselves that they had to include one a very obvious phallic image in every single screen <laughs> and i'm not even joking like everything from trees to buildings to just like you know a painting on the wall or something like that like everything 
um, l- you know, looks phallic in nature or uh, a vaginal in nature. Like, there's <laughs> equal opportunity. Yeah, there, I'm, I'm looking at this one plant in the screenshot. Oh, yeah, the plant. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And um, like the later, uh, you know, iterations of the game, not not so much the ones actually from the 80s and early 90s. There actually is like some some nudity, some, uh, you know, it's it's like, you know, like rated R, you know, nothing too, you know, extreme. Yeah, it's an rated. M rated game. It's uh, M rated. It's, it's not an AO rated game. So they it's not right. that raunchy. And it's, yeah, the idea about it is that it always plays around with the subject, but it's not like, you know, <laughs> uh, but it is funny because, yeah, through you, you know, Larry actually is successful depending on how you wish to, uh, ch- you know, go through his dialogue trees and everything. So, um, and also of note is that this game, as well as the previous one, does include the original voice actor of Leisure Suit Larry. So if you've been playing the game series since the 90s, you'll at least recognize his very kind of snivelly Eugene Levy type voice. <laughs> um, which I, I appreciate. I like when, you know, voice actors get to keep their gig. <laughs> um, but anyways, so the actual gameplay, of course, it's a point and click. You walk around freely. Um, you pick up items. And, of course, well, I would show a screenshot, but the game doesn't allow screenshots. <laughs> um, at one point, so he has this uh, companion. It's an experimental AI that's kind of a Cortana style thing, you know, from Halo. It's a blue lady, laser lady that comes out of his Pi phone. And her name is indeed Pi, like the letter. <laughs> and I mean, sorry, number. Um, well, it is also a letter. Anyways. <laughs> and um, at some point, she's like, you know, when he asks, you know, when he uh, wrecks his ship at the end of um, the first, like, kind of tutorial area uh you know and he's like what do i do now and she's like what you always do wander around aimlessly and pick up everything that isn't nailed down <laughs> and, like things like so it, it makes fun of itself in a in a pleasing way um and yeah it's it's that is how you know it plays you walk around and aimlessly and pick up anything that's not nailed down talk to everybody and eventually you'll figure out what item works on what um and like a lot of modern point and clicks this one also has a grocery list that kind of lets you know you know this is what you have to do to get past this it's fortunately not too handholdy but it's also not super hard <laughs> um it's it's uh, not an old uh, it's, yeah <laughs> it's not a uh yeah i could have put that together to make a better joke couldn't <laughs> i have <laughs> but um uh what was i saying um yeah, it's it's not as difficult as as old school adventure games. So I think newer, uh, you know, people who are into it, like, will find something to like there. And uh, it also implements like other different systems, like because now Larry's in the world of apps and stuff like that. So you can actually access your inventory through apps, even though it's, you know, the literal motion is him putting stuff in his jacket pocket, which is, you know, has infinite space um, that they never really acknowledge. <laughs> um and it even has sequences where you actually build things. So you are supposed to find items that, like, for instance, in the tutorial kind of stage, you build a boat. And so you have to find all the different pieces of a boat. And it kind of gives you a hint because it shows you what the parts of the boat are supposed to look like. And so, of course, you wander around and pick up anything that looks like those pieces. And, um, you know, it's uh, it's pretty cool like that, actually. And... What else is there to say about it? Oh, uh, fans of the old series, or at least of like your 8-bit 80s style point and clicks, will definitely find a nice treat near the end. Let's just say Larry goes into a simulation that acts a little bit like time travel. Oh, geez. Yeah. Well, don't give a, too much away. I'm I'm not. I'm I'm trying to be. Uh, I will just say that it was a part of the game that really appealed. Like you know, impressed me anyway. Nice. Well, the game, uh, it is kind of on the expensive side. It's forty four ninety nine. What do you think of this one? I think that it, you know, it definitely shows that it has a budget. I mean, it's all voice acted. It looks really, really good. Music's good. It's, you know, evocative of, of the leisure suit man. And like I said, it's not too difficult, but it does definitely keep you going and engaged. 
Uh, I think that you know forty four ninety nine is is fine. Um, I mean that's just the full retail price of a game, so I would say it is a buy it if you played the first game and enjoyed it. I would say that if you're just going into this one having not played it, it is still fun. It um, has a point and click adventure game, but honestly, I play the first game first. I mean these two games are literally linked together, so. Yeah. And uh, um, as of as of recording, it is currently on sale. The first game is on sale for eight dollars on the Switch, and uh, the yeah. second game is thirty five ninety nine on the Switch right now. I don't know how long those sale prices so, will be active, but so right now you can get both games for two dollars less than this game's normal retail price. So I would recommend that more than I would recommend just buying this game by itself. Um, in fact, I'm probably going to pick the first one up myself too because nice. I, I enjoy this. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, moving on. Next game to talk about is Atelier Lydie and Suell, The Alchemists and the Mysterious Paintings DX, developed by Gust, published by Koei Tecmo America, released April 22nd on Switch, PS4, and PC for $39.99. Also available in the Mysterious Trilogy Deluxe Pack for $89.99, which will finally be given a verdict on today. Uh, twin sisters Lydie and Suelle are two novice alchemists. One day after discovering a mysterious painting, they get closer to turning their dream of running the best atelier in the kingdom into reality. <laughs> oh! Uh, I'm, oh! I'm awful. I know. Pernell, tell us about your time with Lydie and Suelle. Okay, so this is the last one of the trio. And like I may have mentioned on a previous episode, um, as a deluxe, as a trilogy pack, these are all pretty much within the same like overall timeline and world. Because while I have come to realize during my time with these games that even games prior to this trilogy make an appearance in here and link up, these are like intrinsically linked because this actually takes place like four years after the last game I talked about. And the characters from that game show up in this one too, in important ways, not just cameos. Um, but no matter how you slice it, the main meat of the game centers around two girls, both youngins. Um, I don't, I always mispronounce their damn names. I'm going to call Little and Sue. I'm sticking with it. Don't hold me to it. <laughs> um, who live in a gasp small town, which I guess is really more like a city in this case compared to the other two games. And, um, their mother had passed away and it's just them and their father living in this house and apparently they made a promise to their mother that as you know now that she's gone that they would have the best atelier in the country but they suck at alchemy i don't know who thought to make this terrible promise without the skills to back them up but these <laughs> girls did it um but since they are now in this you know pressure to want to do this and pull this off that is the meaning again like how do we become these successful alchemists without you know having the talent for it so the weird thing about that is even though that's kind of similar to how the other Atelier games tend to work, being that there's always a character who's a novice alchemist who needs to become a pro alchemist, this one has a weird little caveat to it where even though you end up exploring the countryside like you do in the other games, you also occasionally end up in a situation where you can go inside of paintings. And inside of the actual paintings, there's a whole other world to explore. And it's kind of cool because since the painting worlds are not real worlds, quote unquote, they can get a little bit more imaginative with how colorful they are and how vibrant they are. So like, it might be like an angelic heaven looking environment because someone painted it. And now you're inside this weird magic painting. Why are you going on painting? No, I'm not going to tell you. Just not you can do that. <laughs> um, and it also ties into the plot because when they go into these painting worlds, it turns out that the alchemy ingredients they can find there are of exceptional potency. So like they're high quality goods. So it's like if we use these ingredients plus get our skill levels up, we can become the best at atelier in town with this alone. And of course, they end up with a mentor as well who helps them along. Um, a few things I like about this game, though. Uh, one, they, they do have the time element, but you're not really locked out of like story beats. It's more like you can get quests at a, at a novice board, not a novice board. You get quests at a board in the middle of town, and those are time locked. So it might be like, hey, go do this thing, accomplish the goal, and get some money or some alchemy items or whatever. And that ends up working out in your favor. But otherwise, you're not really pressured to get stuff done. You just kind of play as you go and feel comfortable acknowledging the goal. <clears throat> and the other thing I like is that the main way that you progress your atelier to become number one in the land is uh, by way of the country initiating some sort of like ranking system. So in addition to 
eventually, you know, the usual games have you learn a bunch of alchemy experimental Ingram recipes to build your repertoire. You also have to raise your rank within the city's rum ranking system. And what ends up the way that ends up working is by way of A, getting popular enough in town to even reach the point where they will give you a rank test. And then, of course, you have to take on the rank test that the country gives you. And if you pull, pull off, you rank up. But in order to become popular enough, one of the characters comes up with this cool book and it's got like a stupid amount of quests in it. Like it'll be like, just like leave flyers around town, which means go to a bunch of different places, which is like, pretty much is like, was being assuming that you left flyers. Even really odd rudimentary quests, like just jump and just jump 10 times and that counts as one. They consider this your character getting into better shape. Um, and just like a bunch of different things. And of course, the usual being that, you know, make a bunch of cool recipes of high level of high caliber, high quality to your level of quality standards. Um, it's as far as the alchemy itself goes, it hasn't changed a ton. Um, it's still that like a rectangular square and you can use catalyst to alter the square, both in size and also in a build that you can unlock by just like by linking items in it, being their tetramino like shapes. I think I mentioned in a previous episode, how when you select an ingredient, the ingredient corresponds to like a tetramino shape. Yeah. Um, some ingredients nowadays in this game though, you can, they can have like two different sets. So you might get a really good ingredient that has two properties and both properties counts as its own tetramino, which allows you to build up better and bigger products. So catalyst plus high quality ingredients with multiple traits leads to the potential to get better and better stuff. One thing I think may have been an accident on my part, I don't know, but a lot of people say that battle is not that big of a deal in Atelier games. Like the main goal is to experience the story and become good at alchemizing or whatnot. But what I can say is that I think this, due to a particular battle, which may have been previously DLC, but is now included in this game, um, I had an encounter with an enemy that pretty much narrows down that combat probably isn't a big deal. Um, I got into a fight while I was like level five. It was these two giant puny who showed up on a bridge, puny or slimes in this game. And there was a quest on the quest board to defeat this puny, which is like a, just a super boss. I'm like, okay. I mean, if I guess I can't beat him, he'll just kill me or I'll win and get some, a little bit of experience. I alchemized one bomb that did medium fire damage, which is good fire damage. Um, I threw the bomb one attack. It killed both of them in one bomb <laughs> and I gained 35 levels. What? Yeah. I'm like, well, it's, <laughs> go figure there, right? That's like, you just Jeez. gained 35 levels from one attack or one guy on a bridge or correction, two guys on a bridge. And you just pretty much blew past all the enemy levels in that invite in that area. So it's like, hmm, either that was DLC, which it very well could have been in the old games. Or, holy crap, I just kind of screwed the pooch on this and now combat's a joke. Wow. But, <laughs> But there's something to be said about that where I'm just like, you know, I kind of don't care. I mean, now I have these guys who can just kind of hold their own so I can focus on what I'm really concerned about, which is getting those damn recipes out and making really high quality ingredients and then getting cores up to make items that can actually be like held on to and stuff like that. Because um, like I said, the alchemy, the alchemy is the most addictive part of all these games. And this one's included in that. I do hate that even if the timer isn't particularly um, like required for like the main narrative for the most part it still bugs me when an alchemy recipe is like takes three hours or six hours to complete I'm like well fuck that's the whole day <laughs> but i really need to make these things like there's one quest i had was like make 10 healing pads each healing pad took six hours you got 25 days to do the quest so i was like well go collect a bunch of stuff and then make 10 passes in a row but when you really think about it how they do the time and how you run through it your characters are literally sitting in the house at that alchemy pot for like five days in a row without going to bed, <laughs> making <laughs> healing pads to turn in for this quest completion. It's, like, it's, it's just a weird feeling. But just bloodshot eyes at the end of it. <laughs> Here's your healing pads. I hope you feel better, you asshole. Um, <laughs> exploring town is interesting too now because um when you because you can quick travel and the day the game will um advance the time based on how far you have to go to check stuff out but the way they do the tom the exploration is when you go to the map to select your location they show you where all the people are if there's people out and about like you know key characters out and about that can be talk talk to 
They'll tell you if there's anyone specifically as a shop in that zone. And there's like symbology that will tell you if that's where you have to return in like a story based quest or if there's like an actual story event that takes place in the location or if just an optional event occurs in a location. So you can just like go onto the world map and go, hmm, exclamation point. I'll go there and see what the story element is that happens. And it's kind of convenient. Like if you don't want to feel like running around these towns, which I honestly genuinely don't at this point. <laughs> I'm looking around for like, I mean, because that's how it is. Like, I'm, I know the story at this point. I know what I'm doing. I'm giving my alchemy crap. I want to make stuff. I don't feel like exploring town. Unless, of course, you're hoping to find some dried up paper on the ground for alchemy, which you do do um, while you're running around. But if you don't feel like doing any of that, you literally can just warp around town as the symbology di- dictates and talk to people or shop as you need to or whatever. So... It's a very convenient, you know, time-saving element there. I feel like like the only thing I didn't like about this game compared to the other ones um, is that the main character, in every Atelier game, the main character is always kind of like that, like, anime sweetie voice or like, (laughs) but (laughs) in the previous two games, they were dubbed. So they had adult voice actors who still were trying to sound like kids, so they couldn't really get that level of pitch voice where it's just like, oh, God, these are clearly children. Um, so it was okay, but this game, this is the only one of the trio that is not dubbed. It's a completely subtitled game, and the two main girls are very children, very childish, uh, and their voices match. So just a warning that if you if that's grating to your ears, like, hey, yeah, sister, hey, yeah. Um, if that kind of sound great telling you, you prepare yourself for this shit or just turn the voice level down on like the audio. But if you don't care about that, then the narrative is just as wholesome as it always is, which is nice. Um, just like I said, their voices just drove me crazy. Yeah. Um, and also their dad's a deadbeat asshole, but Hey, that's the narrative. <laughs> um, so what are you going to do? Yeah. But, well, would that deadbeat asshole give his kids 40 bucks to buy this one? <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, he takes the 40 bucks so they couldn't afford it, but I digress. He'd spend it on heroin huh? <laughs> oh and this game is magic paintbrushes <laughs> <laughs> uh but uh, i feel like honestly this game is worth is more of a try compared to the other two but by that same token this is a deluxe trilogy pack and the other two were they're definitely buy it titles so with that in mind, you're better off just buying the trilogy pack because it ends up being you get two great Atelier games and one good Atelier game, all at a discount price in comparison to if you didn't get it in the trilogy. So I think the trilogy is worth a, definitely worth the bank. You get a lot of freaking game out of this whole thing. If you're the type of person where it's like, I don't get to buy a lot of games, but you really like RPGs, this one trilogy pack will keep you busy for months. Like I can definitely tell you that right now because whew. There's a lot going on with these things. And yeah, of course, there's a, again, you put a lot of time into this trilogy over the past couple of weeks. So you have been a trooper with this one. Uh, the trilogy is 90 bucks. So what is your official verdict on the Atelier Mysterious Trilogy Deluxe Pack? Buy the shit out of it. It's worth your money. Again, slice of life RPG action. Not emphasis on the action, but a slice of life. And it's a good time. Like an RPG where you don't have to feel like you're stressed about saving the world or people dying around you or whatever. It's a good time. Worth it. Bye. Cool beans. Now, Koei Tecmo, bring that shit to Xbox. Come on. It's the only platform you're leaving out. Uh, I'm almost Game surprised Pass. they have it. <laughs> well, let's not go nuts here. Make people buy a little bit. <laughs> like, uh, next game to talk about is called Very, Very Valet, developed and published by Toyful, released May 25th on Switch for $24.99. One to four players control an elite team of puppet valet working together to overcome any and all valet related challenges. It's going to take teamwork and a certain just park it anywhere mentality to save the world from a severe parking crisis. Not enough to be a valet. Be a very, very valet. Chris, how valet are you? I feel like that word has lost meaning. I've said it so much now. It varies. <laughs> ah. So how's very, very valet? I was going to say, is this thing on? Uh, <laughs> you know, what were you saying? No, go ahead. Tell us about very, very valet. Very, very valet is a four player chaos manager. Um, you may recognize the type of game from such classics as Overcooked. Um, I would actually say this game is very Overcooked-like, um, Ooh, except that... What was that? You just sold it to me. Oh, yeah. So, 
Basically, yes, you uh, up to four players can select a different Muppet and different colors and stuff like that. And uh, the the primary um, puppet, we're going to call him to avoid um, copyright clashing, is like this very uh, weight, you know, butler like, you know, stiff upper lip type of thing. Which is great because it's it totally juxtaposes the actual gameplay, which is you start off in a location like uh, the first stage is a um, a burger place, which has a valet for some reason. <laughs> and literally it, it starts a little bit like uh, like a Fall Guys type of thing where like, you know, it shows like a comic book style shot of a of a airplane going overhead and then like the character diving face first into like the action and then they par- literally parachute into the level and when uh cars drive up from one side of the screen you take them from the customer and then you drive them somewhere <laughs> um organize it however you can there's no uh no nobody's judging you on your uh on your parking <laughs> prowess which is key to the game by the way uh-huh. um, <laughs> and uh yeah when you take their car and just like shove it somewhere um then more cars like will come up in in a line and you have to basically keep uh juggling between getting those cars and then after a little bit of time somebody will come out with a number over their head and then that's you know you have to find their car which of course has the same number over it um And, you know, you just kind of juggle that. The great thing about it um, is that, again, chaos, because the game does not care about you, like, parking them within the lines or or even near (laughs) the parking lot. You can just, again, you shove these cars anywhere, including, like, you know, basically right on top of each other and things like that. As long as you can get to the car, you know. And there's a great move. Okay, never mind. I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, The game doesn't care about that. The other thing is that the physics of the game are absolutely bananas. Oh, geez. Um, the cars are extremely floaty, uh, which, again, is good. It's, that's not really detrimental. Um, the way the car controls, uh, you basically put it in drive, park, and reverse with the same stick. Um, you know, it, and, you know, the controls, of course, change versus whether you're driving forward or reversing. And uh, with the face buttons, you're basically controlling, you know, like, your character. And um, you can literally, like, jump out of the cars. You can, like, launch the cars um, in certain stages and things like that. Um, and you can, like, do this move where, you know, you're parking a car. I'm using emphatic finger quotes here. Um <laughs> And then a person comes out and they want their car and that car's nearby. You can basically like ram into the back of that car, jump your character out of the, out of the car you're parking into the car that you need. And then just like plow it on, you know, over the restaurant and (laughs) right into the right spot for the customer. Again, it's total chaos and it's amazing. Does car Uh, damage matter? Is there car damage? Only, well, not really. It's it's more like um, it's timer damage, and it affects your score. Like, basically, uh, you have to survive phases. And, of course, if you take too long, then the customers get mad. And, of course, that's worse than damaging their cars. But, no, I mean, I, I haven't managed to deliver a car unto a customer that they wouldn't drive away <laughs> and give me points. Again, I think this game is more about the chaos than about being good. <laughs> Now, I will say, all of that comes with a little bit of a caveat. Uh, this game is almost impossible to play one player. <laughs> um, I was going to have Catherine actually play it two player with me, but we ran out of time. Uh, and in fact, I am definitely going to launch this game with the next time I'm around three other people. I'm going to be like, all right, stop everything. We're going to play this right quick. <laughs> uh, because this is absolutely a game that is meant to play with as many, you know, with as many three people as possible because this sounds like Cole, this sounds like something you and your kids would be down to play. Yeah. Yeah. You kind of had me the moment you said it was like overcooked. It's yeah. And it's um, unless it's in a later stage. Cause again, I couldn't clear very many stages as a, as a single player, but, um, and that's not through lack of like, um, training because it has a very good tutorial, uh, like you get to run into cones and stuff. So like it actually teaches you everything about the game um, right there in the um, in the tutorial section. But you know, once you get into it, it's just really hard to juggle all that stuff. 
But again, it took me a little longer to learn it because at first I was like, okay, so they want me to do this right, right? Because that's what I did in the tutorial. And then I was like, oh, no, actually, (laughs) they don't care. And then once I found that out, I was like, okay, now I can actually clear these. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, I it's seems like a wonderful multiplayer game. Um, The magic is diminished a little bit by the one player mode, but because of the cool, like chaotic things that you can do and like all the like, you know, jump driving and running over everything, like I literally would plow through like the lines of people coming in. Uh, to get somebody's car to them if it was on that side of the parking lot, you know, <laughs> like it, it's um, it's a wonderful chaotic game and um, and I quite like it. But yes, I would like to play it with more people. Nice. So overall, twenty four ninety nine on this one. What do you think about it? Again, if you got people that are going to play it, um, absolutely worth it. This is um, this is one of those this this game has a destiny as a as a really <laughs> classy party game um but uh, you know i don't see any reason to recommend it to anybody who's just going to be playing it solo so makes sense yeah all right next up is mayhem in single valley developed by fluxcopic limited published by tiny build released may 20th on steam for 14.99 in this fast-paced puzzle loaded action adventure you'll juggle housework zombie hordes family dinners and radioactive squirrels Oh, and you have to prevent the end of the world while keeping everyone from finding out it was all your fault. Oh, what did you do? I didn't do anything. I was Bullshit. Framed. What did you do? I was framed, I tell you. Uh, no, you really are framed. You play as a, a young guy, a little college dude. Um, I don't even remember his name. Uh, dude. But, yeah, apparently he was just college dude. It was... I don't even remember if the game even says it. I don't think it does. Um... Well, he plays a little college guy, and or he's getting ready to leave for college or whatever. You got to run him through his basic day of like, oh, you got to pick up his shoes, and you got to get his money down that his grandma saved for him, and you got to get his plane ticket. You got to help by putting his baby brother to bed. His dad is a useless lump on a log. His mom is always doing all the dishes. He, you can cheer her up by, by giving her a flower. Um, I keep saying college, dude. A lot of the chores it asks you to do kind of implies that you're young and running away from home. But all the other stuff I found was like, oh, no, he's leaving for college. I'm like, I don't think he was. (laughs) Um, I'm really bothered by, by like, trying to figure out the story around this character. Uh, Anyway, he's getting one last view out of his treehouse before he. You okay? Y'all hear that? <laughs> no. Oh, there was a huge hear. ass truck go up the road. It was like shaking the house. Oh. <laughs> uh, I was like, nope, I know there that. was just awkward silence that will be truncated what? by my program, and we had no clue what's going on. <laughs> I, I, I was like, there's no way the mic's not picking that up because it's got to be louder than me. Joe, um, you got to add like some foley of like, you know. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly what it sounded like. Uh, but yeah, anyway. He's he's leaving. You gotta help out and do a few things. Like, gotta throw away the dog shit. And the dog just, like, rapid fire shit out of its ass all the time for you to pick up and throw away. Um, anyway, he's, he's looking out of the treehouse before he bids everything adieu. And somebody is dumping chemicals into the creek behind his house. I guess it's a river not big enough by Kentucky standards to be a river. Oh, God. <laughs> it's a creek. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. There's a waterway behind his house. Is it a creek jumping. or a crick? <laughs> no, we don't call it a crick here. That's that's not a Kentucky thing. That's a, like, Texas. Um, Texas does weird things like that. <laughs> now you're just trying to blame other people. I was just trying to see if Chris would pipe up. <laughs> be like, uh-huh. It doesn't come up enough in conversation. Do you say creek or crick? I say creek because that's how it's spelled. But I'm also a little bit of an you know aberrant case. Yeah, an enigma. <laughs> anyway, somebody dumping pollutants into the waterway. Now everything's gone rabid. Starts off with a rat or or a squirrel who attacks Granny, and you gotta like. 
say for Walker for, but because you're not some kind of like superhero or soldier in anything like that, your best solution for dealing with these radioactive zombie creatures is just to like throw an acorn and grab a lid off a trash can and run. Um, there's no map and there's no guidance for where to go. So good luck. Everything about mayhem, uh, makes you feel like they don't want you to succeed at playing mayhem. (laughs) It's really unfortunate. Your character moves slow. He has no protection of any kind. He's just, there's even a thing at the beginning like, oh, if he's moving too fast, take his shoes off and he'll slow down. And the whole time I'm playing, I'm like, slowing down is the absolute last possible thing <laughs> I want to do. It's a one-hit kill situation. So if anything gets you, you're fucked. It never even explains to you that you can find things to throw and and distract the zombies. So you just kind of have to do it on accident. That's really crummy. <laughs> Not to mention because it's animals and things like that that are that are being zombified, people will turn into zombies too and you can throw hot dogs to distract them. <laughs> uh as you do. Uh, and <laughs> you can throw hot dogs to distract them, but because it's animals, you can't just like throw an acorn at a rabbit, right? It doesn't give a fuck. So you need to find um like carrots and pull the carrots and then you can throw those. But if you actually, in order to, to actually like get through your inventory and to have the items to throw, you have to press LB and RB because it won't cycle through your items on its own. Hmm. So you have to constantly be paying attention to what your inventory <laughs> has on hand, or you may find yourself just dying because you can't actually have anything to throw. And it has to be the item that you need. So you may walk into a group of rabbits and be like, well, I had acorns because how the fuck was I supposed to know that rabbits were going to be up here? Um, it really... It really fucks you with the difficulty. Everything else, I I complained about how slow your character moves and everything else is super fucking speedy because they're radioactive rabbits for fuck's sakes. (laughs) Um, Or plants. Sometimes there are plants. It's just a constant barrage as well of different enemies. Then you've got to immediately know what their, their weakness is going to be. To actually combat any of these things... You start uh, dipping items in hooch, which is moonshine liquor. It's, it's poor man's liquor. Um, and and basically making like drunken carrots and drunken acorns and drunken hot dogs to throw. But there's so little of the hooch around to actually get your hands on. And then you have to take the time to actually mix it and craft the 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 items that will will cure the zombies, if you will. It's all just, it's too much, and it takes too long, and it's too difficult, and you're going to die a dozen times for no good reason for it. Oh. I wanted to like it! <laughs> and yeah, I'm this, just this so looked frustrated. like something, when I first saw it, it looked like something that you would just be all over. Yeah, and it was just, it's so frustrating to actually play it, that it it loses all of its shine. Well, it's fifteen bucks. So, what is your verdict? I, do I have to say it's not? I I think I do. I I think they could fix it. I think they could like balance it. And, what would you and do to it fix better. it? A hundred percent. I'd make <laughs> slow down the enemies a little bit, and I'd work on on fine tuning that inventory so that it's a little more manageable. Um, items that are similar should stack. And you should just be able to to dynamically roll through them without having to like fumble and go, oh, this box has two uh, hot dogs, but that one's got eight acorns, and now there's four more hot dogs, and then there's some carrots. Like they should they should be a little more. If for that matter, they could have broke them up and like and and distributed them amongst um like the D pad. Like you could change between them on the D pad or something would have no. been easier. Or even just face buttons for it. I don't know. I just, it it could have 
it could have been better and that's what makes it frustrating to give it a deny it as it is but for fifteen dollars as as frustrating as it was i'm sure there's people who are, are all over it and are going to be like ah if anybody listened to this they'd be like ah what the fuck is wrong with this bitch but i, I, I say just, that every week i i know but oh, i just cool. think there's <laughs> so much that they could have done to smooth it out before they put it out like it is and it, it makes me sad Ah, well, got to move on. Next game to talk about is called Kung Fu Jesus, developed and published by Celestial Gold Studios. It released May 27th on Steam for $14.99. Join Kung Fu Jesus on a psychedelic genre-busting beat-em-up set in a madcap world where organized crime, alternate dimensions, and hardcore martial arts converge from the seedy underworld to the spiritual plane and beyond. Nothing is as it seems in Kung Fu Jesus. Chris, tell us about your time with Kung Fu Jesus. <laughs> okay, so it's hard to describe. But um, so I'm going to say, like, basically, so it feels like a combination of a couple of things. Um, for one, it's definitely like a Unity game. Um, I'm starting to kind of understand what that means um, as I play more and more of these things. But basically, it's kind of like somebody took a bunch of assets from, you know, with Unity and was like, okay, now let's make them weird. And okay, that's now a character of some kind, you know? No. Yeah. Um, that's th that kind of thing. So most of the game is a beat em up <clears throat> where, you know, you just beat up either figments of your imagination or actual people. Um, you know, there's like boss fights and all kinds of special fights and things like that. And it's occasionally broken up by, um, various like behind the shoulder type of um of like racing things i guess that the best way to describe it would be like um the bonus stages of sonic 2 where you run through the like the half pipe and like there's like things you have to collect yeah it's kind of like that <clears throat> and you know there's some other little surprises as well um so the game story is nuts, and it doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, you wake up in your house as Kung Fu Jesus, who is just a, a dude with, a, you know, with a hat, and there's nothing mess up. Well, I mean, at least uh, in the part that I played, there was nothing seemingly too messianic about him. Uh, but there is martial arts, so there is that. Um, and yeah, he's working for the big boss, and there's, you know, some anti, like, um, there, like, you literally at some points can sit down and just watch your, the TV in your house, right? And it just is this voiceover that does all of this, like, talks about all this metaphysical stuff and, like, kind of anti capitalist stuff and all this other stuff. And, you know, that's just, that's just there, like, there for you to enjoy. And, like I said, occasionally he leaves his house, and that's where the beat em up sections uh, happen. And yeah, you're basically just trying to uncover the plot. And uh, sometimes you'll go to bed and have nightmares where, you know, uh, a strange morphed face of like some Scottish guy in the background is yelling at you about how much, how worthless you are and stuff in a cute uh, Scottish accent. <laughs> I'm very <laughs> confused by this game. Yes. Uh, the game is very much like transparently, you know, basically saying, ha ha, I've confused you. Are you not, uh, you know, is your mind blown yet? <laughs> like, well, OK, <laughs> I just did a beat em up and like some strange stuff happened. Like, OK, that's, you know, it they they um, they definitely feel like they're taking you for a ride. But at the core <laughs> of it, it's just a beat em up. I mean, with some other stuff in it. Now, I will say that it it has enough humor in it for sure uh for instance i got to do some uh kung fu training with a master s who uh lives in the sewers with his um with his turtle pals raffo and like leo and you know <laughs> no copyright uh infringement intended characters oh bebo and rocky were there too oh jeez and yeah that fight was impossible <laughs> it was so hard uh yeah the game has like this inconsistent thing where it's like it will really ratchet up the difficulty sometimes like to the point where it almost feels like a gilson b pontus jam 
But fortunately, the people who made this actually do did know how to make a video game. So it that's, you know, I don't mean to invoke the Pontus, but the uh, <laughs> yes, you do. That's but real sometimes real. sometimes you'll feel like, um, do I keep going? <laughs> you know, at this point, you know, well, it's the game, 15 bucks on Steam. So what do you think of Kung Fu Jesus? That at fifteen dollars, I'm going to give it a try. It um, because it doesn't like it. It the thing that it has going for it is the psychedelic stuff. Like it's very you know if you really want to zone out on that type of stuff. And you know there are definitely games that do that. Um, you know I reviewed um oh what was that I can't remember it started with a V and then there was like would you like a packet and that game that type of stuff where you know they really want to like show you something different and play with your mind and stuff. And that I appreciate that genre. Honestly, I really think that it's cool, but as a beat em up and, you know, as a, as the thing that it is like gameplay wise, I'm going to say it's probably not worth the 15 bucks at this point, but you know, I think that it's, yeah, I say that if you appreciate weirdness, then you should definitely check it out at some point. Cool. Yeah. All right. Next up is Eagle Island Twist, developed by Pixelnix, uh, published by Screenwave Media, released May 28th on Xbox One, Switch, and PS4 for $14.99. Discover the avian adventure with Quill and Koji, or newcomers Fia and Kusako, or uh, Kusaka, I can't tell, friggin' Squiggle. Damn you, proofreading Squiggle, Kusako. Ooh, did I say it right? Pronounced? Did they? Do they say it in the game? Am I just? No. They, nope. We're just. We're going to guess it. They do not pronounce it. You just see Kusaku, and you're like, I think that's a word, and you're okay with it. Cool. Explore lush forests, treacherous caverns, and uncover the ruins of long lost civilizations on the island of Yulu in an unforgettable adventure. Brunel, tell us about your time with Eagle Island Twist. I kind of want to just actually, I think I am going to do that actually. So Eagle Island Twist is in and of itself more so a second game that Pixelnix created in response to criticism that they received for the original game, which is Eagle Island. For the record, if you don't own Eagle Island yet, you're buying Eagle Island Twist, which includes Eagle Island. So since there's already tons of info out there about Eagle Island proper, the real question becomes, what the hell is Eagle Island Twist? So, Eagle Island Base was a roguelike style game where you controlled a guy named Quill who had like an owl buddy who was helping him explore the island to rescue his bird friend. And throughout the course of that game, you would over time collect elemental feathers, which would give your owl friend elemental property powers. But it was a roguelike at its core. This game, Twist is basically them saying, what if we took the gameplay style of Eagle Island, but made it a honed platformer where we designed the stages methodically, like a platformer. So handcrafted levels instead of procedural. Exactly. And what I can say from my time playing Eagle Island and then switching to Twist to get the real meat and potatoes of that game, I like Twist a lot more. Um, So... One thing about it, for example, I need to point out outright was that some of the gripes I had about Eagle Island in general were uh, that there are medallions that you get in the game which represent power-ups, so to speak. Like, there are time power-ups you can find in treasure chests that you open up with gold seeds, which you earn by beating enemies with combo attacks. Um, And those abilities are might be things like uh, you you can wall jump or items are drawn to you. Just general things. But never did I really feel like they really helped or mattered. It was just kind of like these random things you could get. And it was almost never guaranteed. You weren't really guaranteed to get a specific thing. It's like, here's this item. I guess you'll use it. I don't know. Whatever. Um, But in this game, while they did keep that medallion power system going, um, the treasure chests that had the power-ups in them always have that power up because they're kind of home with the intent being you'll use it on that stage. So for example, if you come across a treasure chest that has the wall jump medallion in it that you can purchase to open up, you'll probably want to use the wall jump somewhere in that stage before it wears off. So again, fine crafting makes all the difference in how power ups are utilized in a game. Same with like invulnerability and stuff like, Hey, maybe if you get invulnerability here, you'll want to be invulnerable for the next screen. Um, in addition to that, another thing I like about this new game 
is that um, not every level, but some of the levels will have uh, like a gimmick, sort of. What I mean by a gimmick is similar to how you can find medallions that give you certain power-ups. Some levels will have, you start out with a medallion that you can't take off and it's locked in for the entire stage. And it's usually meant to make it harder for you. For example, there might be a level where every enemy, all the, you know, I mentioned the nuts that you can use to open treasure chests and stuff. Um, this might be a level where when you make those or those nuts appear, instead of being able to collect them, they're actually explosive and they'll hurt you. <laughs> so every enemy you kill releases bombs like a freaking cave shooter and you got to dodge them because they will kill you. Um, has a lot of work to it. Another level I came across that particularly drove me nuts was a level where you were sliding around the entire stage. You had like these weird ice shoes and every step you took froze the ground and enemies around it, but you also skated around like freaking Oksana Bollier or whatever. So it was or <laughs> Oksana Bayou. There we go. Um, so in the end, you were kind of just boned because if you even someone just tried to walk like a normal running uh, runner, you would ultimately end up killing yourself. So you had to like be very methodical how you jumped around and messed. And it made the levels pretty tough. With that said, all the levels are pretty freaking tough in this game. It is not easy. In fact, while you could start playing this game immediately with Eagle Island Twist, it's almost recommended that you just play Eagle Island a little bit first to get a handle for what the powers are, what they do, and what they can do. Because in that game, as you get new powers, they're like, press the button to do this, use it to do this thing, da da da. But in Eagle Island Twist, even though you can hover over the item and get a brief description, they assume you already know what the abilities are capable of. Um, so be mindful of that. Um, and as you pretty much, the way the game works is like it's got that Donkey Kong Country feel to it where you go to a level, it's got a name that's got like a lot of alliteration or something like Tick Tock Tabby or, you know, Rickety Ricket Rock Rage or something, a bunch of R's in there. Um, and then you go on there and it's a theme stage, auto scrollers, crazy powers. And then also at the end of each level, you can find like a little, like a gem core. That's the goal to complete a stage. But every level also has like that, a collectathon sub goal where if you can get like 130 rock, like the collectible item, you'll get like a gold medallion versus the silver medallion for a half score. Now, what that means is being a platformer that's methodically crafted, they do that thing where they have a checkpoint in the middle of a stage. And if you die, you have a set of lives that you can use to restart the checkpoint. But when you do, you start with no uh, none of the collectible currency that you found throughout the stage, which means to get the gold medallion, you got to find all the hidden gems or all the hidden collectible items plus normal ones. And you can't die on the entire stage run because if you do, it'll wipe them out. So in order to basically max complete this game, you have to master the game, which... I kind of like when gamers do that. Um, they make you work in earnest, so you can't say, this game is easy. Well, like, clearly it's not if you even freaking max it out. Get to work, <laughs> chump. Um, so they make you put in the work, and the game itself, again, is not easy. I also like that some of the levels introduce new feathers that I didn't come across in the main game, which gives you new abilities that you didn't have in that main game. Most particularly was one that I wish you did have the whole freaking game, which was like a sort of a teleporting one where you throw the bird and when it stops flying, you teleport to where the bird stopped. However, if the bird collides with an enemy, then you can chain attack just like you can in a normal game where if you throw the bird, it hits a guy and you can catch the bird and throw it again. But with the teleport bird, you warp to the, where the enemy was and then you can throw the bird again. So you can just kind of chain yourself up enemies to go up, come you know, up areas and stuff like that or across large chasms, cool stuff like that. So, like, honestly, I had a good time with playing this game. I like the idea of trying to play through each level, see what new gimmick they try to introduce into it. All the bosses are a pain in my damn ass. <laughs> I was able to beat, like, I was actually thankful. Sometimes you can find, like, a little bit of a gimmick for them, but there's, like, a mushroom I came across. You can kiss my ass. Um, but while the enemies are hard, again, I think this is the, this was intended to be as, like, okay, if you played Eagle Island, here's the real hard hit caboodle. But with that said... This is a good game. I I know there was a bit of a guff about the original game, and I didn't dislike it, though I can say that I wasn't a big fan of it due to like how I felt that the powers were kind of milk toast and stuff. I didn't really feel jazzed about getting new abilities and stuff in that game. But with this game, even if I do find myself occasionally being like, eh, I don't really care about that power up in that chest. That's not a big deal. I honestly just liked moving around the stages and trying to complete them. 
that are fun to play in their own right. Also, I should mention one other thing, which I totally thought about, but I should have. So the combat in this game, like I may have mentioned earlier, was that you have to throw the bird at enemies, basically grab it, throw it. Um, but there is a combo system that is a factor into this game. If you every time you hit one, a combo, a timer starts. You don't see the timer, but there's a timer. And if you can hit another enemy before the timer runs up, you'll get a combo times two, times three, times four, et cetera, et cetera. If you get a times two combo, generally the enemy will drop what's called a mana rock. You need mana rocks to use the special bird feather powers that you can have. Um, so if the bird has like his base form, but you want to use like the fire bird, which explodes when it contacts guys, you need a mana rock for that. Or the freeze power, you need a mana rock for that. Um, so you'll do combos of two to earn more mana rocks in addition to sometimes breaking boxes or finding them in, uh, on the ground. If you get a combo of three or higher, you'll get a health item, which will generate some health back. And this, they did make it easier to get health by being able to find it in boxes or hitting around the boards. It's still a way to get health if you need it, and you are going to need it. So get good at comboing, because you'll regret it if you don't. Um, but that is in the game, too. And I feel like I should mention that, because comboing is a pretty important mechanic, I think, in the game. Yeah. So. Well, overall, 15 bucks. you're basically getting two games. Oh, yeah. And honestly, I think the twist alone is worth $15. So you're basically getting Eagle Island for free. So go ahead and buy it. Cool. Works for me. Uh, next game to talk about is Cloak and Dasher, developed and published by Spirit Stone Studio. New version releasing June 1st on Steam and is currently $4.99 in early access. Insanely fast, wildly fun guide Cloak in their search for riches through a maze of ruins full of deadly traps and weird monsters in this 2D single screen platformer. Fluid gameplay, simple controls, and short challenging levels that can be completed in seconds if you're quick and skilled enough. Chris, tell us about your time with Cloak and Dasher. Okay, so Cloak and Dasher is, yeah, it's a single screen challenge platformer, which means that you have your tiny, tiny, tiny character uh, moving at breakneck speed through these big cavernous rooms, and you have to get from one end to the other and, you know, collect stuff and, dot, you know, try not to run afoul of the many spikes that are just all over the place. Uh, of course, this one also has, you know, things like enemies and... Um, and stuff to like bounce off of and, you know, other kind of hazards as well. Of course it ramps up. Um, so what I like about this one is that, you know, your character is really fast, but it, as is required in any of these kind of games that are, you know, any good, uh, the controls are extremely precise. Like it's really, I mean, the controls are basically perfect. Um, that's usually enough for me to be like, okay, yes, I can play this. And um, so it is where you basically run and you can jump or double jump, of course. And uh, you can also dash. And dash also gives you a little bit, you know, a few frames of invincibility, which you're going to need because sometimes there are hazards that require you to kind of dash through them uh, rather than, you know, dodge them or anything like that. Um, you know, like arrows that get... Uh, fired through the wall and things like that. Um, and yeah, as far as like the level design, which of course is another really important thing, I really like that this game is it's nice and challenging, but it's not like impossible. It's not one of those things where you have to like memorize the level or anything like that. Like you can pretty much intuitively get through most of it. Um, another cool thing about this one is that it features. Um, a lot more like kind of engagement with a larger community. For instance, there's a community section where you can access their Discord and Twitter and stuff from uh, from there. But also, it uh, keeps track, of course, of the speed and the amount of extra challenge, like gems that you pick up through the stages. They put gems in these spots that are really hard to get to, so that if you get through them, then you know that's of course a uh, you know proves that you got through the level in a much harder way than simply running for the door. Um, because some, it's funny too, because some stages are set up where all you would have to do is like just jump over one thing and you can get to the door and end the level. Or you can go back and do all these jump tricks and all this other stuff to like get these four gems that are, you know, in there. <clears throat> just as an example. But, uh, so that's kind of cool. And they tally all that stuff up and then they give you your, um, your time and, you know, award you 
um, things, you know, based on that. But also, so that's, you know, the adventure mode is where you go through each, like, chunk of levels, which vary, which is interesting. It goes from, like, four levels to, like, maybe, like, um, you know, 18 levels and then, like, 10 levels, things like that. And they also promise that there are more levels that are going to get added every month. Um, For how long? I don't know. Hopefully a while. Uh, But there was, like, 50-something levels when I played through it. Um, there's also, like I said, uh, that's adventure mode. And then you have the time trial mode where you can go through each one of the, you know, tiny stages and try to beat your best time. And it actually ranks it against everybody who plays the game. So you kind of got a little mini, um, you know, uh, what do you call it? (laughs) Just like a, a speed run competition kind of thing, ranking global ranking. Uh, for every level, so I think that's kind of cool too. Uh, the game looks good, like I said, it controls perfect and it sounds pretty good. It's just you know, it's a game that you know if you don't like challenge platformers, then don't go anywhere near it because <laughs> that's what it is for sure. <laughs> well, at the five bucks it's asking right now, before it goes up in price, they they said the price may go up uh, with with the addition of feature, so it may go up in price on full release. It's five bucks right now. Yeah. What do you say? Right now, it's worth five bucks for sure. They were they were correct to do that um, because yeah, it, again, you know, there's no uh, building on the character or anything like that. They just make the stages more elaborate. Which again, I think that the stage design is very clever. So, um, and yeah, they are promising to add more stages and other stuff. So I'm looking forward to seeing where they go with it. Cool. Yeah. All right. One final game to talk about tonight is a preview of Toy Tinker Simulator developed by Turquoise Revival Games, published by Grab the Games. It's releasing soon on Steam, but you could check out the free prologue right now on Steam. Have you ever wanted to be a toy tinker? This is a unique chance to become one. Repair toys and start your toy museums to make everyone happy. Cole, tell us about your time previewing Toy Tinker Simulator. So... Toy Tinker, <laughs> I knew I was going to fuck up. Yes. I knew I was going to fuck it up. Toy Tinker Simulator. <laughs> Every time I've had to tell somebody what I was playing when I played it, I was like, I, I this is going to bomb. <laughs> and I did. Um, it's basically a, a shop simulator in the same vein as the, like, um, car mechanic simulator, PC building simulator. It's it's in that same that same little wheelhouse. So if you like having a sim where you um, take things apart, repair them, clean them, put them back together, in this case particularly, it's toys you'll be working with, um, then you're gonna be pretty happy with what Toy Tinker Simulator has to offer. Um, you'll need to. You load up your your laptop and you'll have different job offers that you can accept. In the preview, you can only um, have, I think it's three that I was able. No, there were more than three that I was able to do, but you have to be level three to unlock more. And it's capped. You don't actually earn XP in the, in the preview. So it's just, um, you can't go beyond what what the little scope there is. Um, So it's pretty limiting, but it is just, it's not even technically a beta of any sort. I don't think it's just, here's what we're working on Mm. type of gameplay. Um, But it's, it's what you would expect for a game of this caliber. So it's like, um, go accept the job for, um, cleaning up like a little wooden seal looking toy, right? So then once you accept or before you can accept the job, you have to go into the marketplace and buy the things you're going to need for that job. So if it's a little wooden toy, you're going to need a sanding, uh, a sander if you don't have that equipment already. And you're also going to need varnish. And then you'll use your mouse to run over the toy to sand it after you take all the parts apart. Um, and then you'll varnish it. And then you can take it. If you've got a printer, you can put stickers on it. And then you take pictures of the old version and the new version. I will say I, I don't want to like harp on this, obviously, because it's just a like a preview. I 
would have liked to have seen a few options, though, a little more in depth. Maybe they'll surface before the game actually goes uh, full release. But in other games in this genre type, typically you interact more and you have a little more say in what you're doing to the to the item you're working on. Um, PC Building Simulator, for example, gives you the options to to actually like look through different parts and and choose what you want to put in and they just give you like a vague hey i want this computer to do x y or z in toy tinker simulator everything's just like there's no fail you just click and either it works or it doesn't and you just keep clicking and, and it won't let you fuck up in any kind of way so there's no option to mess up or change or be creative with the toys as it currently stands. Now, as far as it goes beyond what's in the preview, I don't know. Maybe maybe there will be more option to to be a little more creative and um, create more unique toys as opposed to just, hey, take this, sand it, paint it exactly the way we tell you to, and then... Click the button to take a picture of it, which you can't actually customize the picture either. It's just push the button on the phone to take a picture. Mm -hmm. Um, I would have liked to just, for a simulator, let me fuck around with it a little more and give me a little more freedom. But like I said, it's preview. Who knows? They may do that. Early. This is still based on just the the prologue on Steam. Uh, Is it worth downloading and checking out the prologue? Should people check this out? Yeah, if you if you like other simulator games, you you're probably gonna want to get in and and mess around with this one and see if it's gonna be to your liking. And hey, join their Discord and and back the game on Kickstarter and maybe have a little input and see some of the some of the things that you prefer to see in a simulator maybe come to life and be added to the game. Cool. Yeah. All right. Well, that is it for this episode. We made it through. The cats made it through. My two foot tall alien statue made it through. <laughs> Seriously, if you if you're statue. in the Twitch stream, how fucking cool is that statue? <laughs> that is so goddamn cool. I love it. It is, it is a pretty good gimme, gimme, statue. Gimme, gimme. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we made it through. That's all the reviews that we got for the night. Uh, thanks to all of y'all for being here and hanging out and keeping us company. Do any of you have any final words to end the show? Um, buy the games we liked and don't buy the games we didn't like, or just mm-hmm. do it anyway. Do what you want. We can't force you to do what you don't want to do. It's your yeah, life, live, live your own life. Be you. Be free and be you. Be cool. Be free. Be happy at Dairy Queen. They'll treat you right.